Hey, thank you so much for joining me for my talk about GitHub Actions and PowerShell. Before I begin, I'd like to thank the DevOps Collective for their incredibly generous gift that they awarded me last year as the Git Grant recipient. It was awesome. They gave me $10,000 that GitHub then doubled to $20,000, and I was able to share a lot of that money with the DBA Tools team. We got on Twitter. We celebrated. We all upgraded our offices. So thanks again. I only wish I could be there in person to show the appreciation that I have for such an amazing award. Thank you. So my name is Chrissy LaMare, and I'm a Microsoft MVP awarded for my work in both PowerShell and SQL Server. I'm also a GitHub star, which is essentially an MVP of GitHub. For my day job, I'm now a security engineer at General Dynamics after nearly 20 years of being a SQL Server DBA. And how did I make that move? I actually used all of the knowledge that I picked up along the way, things like authentication, authorization, working with AD, automating PowerShell, and I changed up my resume just a little and I applied for the job and I got it. So I just wanna put this out there. If you have an interest in systems, if you have an interest in PowerShell, PowerShell, there is a need for your skill set within the information security world. So if you're thinking of making the move, please feel free to reach out. You can find me on Twitter. I'm at twitter.com slash CL. And also, if you have any questions about GitHub actions that weren't addressed within this presentation, I'd be happy to hear from you there as well. So when I was trying to figure out how exactly to distill GitHub Actions, I watched a whole bunch of videos on YouTube about like simplified explanations. But what I've decided to do is first give you the formal definition provided to us by GitHub and then tell you how it is that I use GitHub Actions in my current workflows. So GitHub Actions is an API for cause and effect on GitHub. It allows you to orchestrate any workflow based on any GitHub event while GitHub actually manages the execution. It provides some really nice feedback and it secures every step along the way, which means that you can securely store API tokens, passwords, Azure logins. And with GitHub Actions, workflows and steps are just code in a repository. It's just some YAML. So you can create, share, reuse, and fork your software development process. So I got involved with GitHub Actions pretty much in beta. I was really excited whenever they came out because my largest project, DBA Tools, which is a PowerShell module for SQL Server, we have an app there that we run a whole bunch of commands against like 10 different runners. But I really like when things are natively available and just part of my workflow. So I was excited about the potential for GitHub Actions since it's all in the GitHub repository. And what I did was I set up a workflow that was a matrix and it would spin up uh, three different VMs. There was Linux, there was Mac and Windows, and it would import DBA tools and then run a command. And that would ensure that DBA tools remained cross-platform compatible. But then I saw that there was this GitHub Actions Marketplace and I really wanted to get involved, but PowerShell wasn't really supported. Uh, you could run it in containers, but mostly if you wanted to create a GitHub Action, that would have to be done in TypeScript. And TypeScript has been on my to-do list for a very long time, but I haven't gotten around to it. Well, in August of 2020, my buddy Sanderstad, who's a PowerShell MVP, he reached out and he's like, Chrissy, oh my God, I'm using GitHub Actions to spin up a Linux container. And then I test all of my PowerShell commands against that container. And I even use T-SQL T, which is some unit testing for T-SQL. And I thought that was amazing. And I thought that it would be really, really awesome to have a similar process for the module that I was working on called Tintool which is an API wrapper for Tenable.sc and Nessus. So I thought, man, I know that like there's a SQL Server container out there, but is it possible to have a Nessus container? And I searched on hub.docker.com and I found one and that really started um, me getting into GitHub Actions and, you know, never had to end up learning Azure DevOps because it does seem like this is where it's headed. So let's take a look at one of my first workflows. It should be pretty straightforward. 
First, this is YAML, and shout out to the YAML haters because I was expecting horror. And, you know, between like using VS Code and YAML, I found this process to be pretty pleasant. It's human readable and a lot of fun. So here we have the name, which is Actions Workflow. You can name it whatever you would like. And then on is an event. In this case, anytime that I push a change to my repository or if I perform a, a pull request, then this workflow is run. Next, I set my default shell to push, which works on Windows, Mac, and Linux. It's pre-installed on these little runners or these little VMs that spin up each time. The default shell is bash. And by the way, I just copy pasted this from Sanders repository. So if you'd like to come to my repository and copy paste from there, you're more than welcome to. If you'd like to go out to Sanders repository, um, you can do that as well. And I'll also have the code available from powershell.org. So here we have the steps. This, the next one is the checkout. So it checks out your repository. And then here is where I download and start the container. If you're familiar with Docker, then this should be pretty familiar. In this case, I expose the required ports. I set the host name, I give it a name, and then I download the required image, which takes about 10 seconds. And I wondered, GitHub, has a container repository called the GitHub Container Repository. And I wondered if that would make it faster to download the, the image. And I was really surprised. It doesn't save that much time, but it does allow me to create a private image that nobody else can download which I preferred because I did want to have top to bottom security. So I did put some additional certificates on my own image. Next up, I write the, the Nessus license to disk. Now the Nessus license is available for anyone. It's called Nessus Essentials and you can scan up to 16 computers, but that isn't something that I want to share because it is my license. So I store that in secrets and that is you just create it at the repository and we'll, we'll go ahead and do that now. Although you can use VS code to do this as well, but let's go ahead and take a look at what it looks like to create create that. So here we're at my repository. And if I click on settings, you can see here, there are some secrets and I just go ahead and create my secret. So I can say new repository secret sup, <laughs> sup, and then add a secret that way. And then those secrets become available within PowerShell. Again, this could be your API key. This could be a password or it could be your Nessus license. So now we're back at the workflow. And we could see I have that dot license, right? You just copy paste this. It's just some YAML formatting. Again, I'm really heavy on the copy paste. So I copy pasted this format and then I ran the, the classic PowerShell dollar sign ENV colon in license and I piped that to set content and I wrote that license to disk. Next, I went to town with some PowerShell and notice here that the run is all on one line. Um, if you want to use multiple lines of code, then you're just going to put this pipe right here and then paste in your code. So now we name it, which makes it really easy to identify when you're running your action. And then we run, we have this pipe and this should look familiar to you as a PowerShell person. I import my module and this does use the root of your repository. So in this case, 10 tools.psd1 is in the root of my repo. So I import that module, I use a splat and then I connect to the service. Once I've established that connection, and the service, by the way, is this Docker container right here. And once I establish that connection, I then run my pester tests and I make sure that there's a throw here because if you don't include a throw, then it's just going to show green even if there are failures. But you could copy paste this. I actually um, copy pasted it from Justin Grody and I really like it. It's very simplified. And so you can copy paste it from uh, the code that's provided with this presentation as well. Next up, we're going to actually watch a workflow happen. This was a real life workflow. Now this is whenever it was a more advanced workflow. So I have my security set. I have my licenses set. I do a few additional pester tests. And then I also have moved, like I mentioned before, from Docker Hub to the GitHub container repository. 
So now I'm replacing a single emoji within my workflow file and I wanna make sure that this doesn't break the 10 tools module. So we can see just right out the gate, it's going to set up the job. It's going to, going to log into the GitHub container repository uh, using a variable set in my secrets. Now it's starting up the container, it usually takes about 10 seconds. Next up, I write my license to disk, I write my certificates, I make my VM trust my certificates. I go and I get my required PowerShell modules from the PowerShell gallery. It skipped the install. We'll see what happened there very soon. Next up, I'm initializing the Nessus server and I'm running my pester tests. And we could see as soon as this turns green, now I did include this API and the route not available within this um, because I did wanna highlight some things don't work on containers, but most, most things do. So now we have a green check and we know that the changes that I made don't negatively impact the functionality of 10 tools. So let's look at the use cases. The first one is, we've already seen it, uh, testing new commits so that you can rest easy knowing that changes proposed in a PR won't break your project. And next, automating tedious tasks like documentation and release notes updates. These are really manual tasks if you haven't taken the time to do it within your CI CD project. And we've had humans assigned to it and after a while they're like, see ya, cause it's just tedious. So if you automate that and you can do it within GitHub Actions, it's a perfect use case to use GitHub Actions workflows. Next, as I talked about before, building projects against Linux, Windows, and Mac OS. So if you're creating a cross-platform module, then you could use GitHub Actions to ensure that it works across the board. Next, building projects against the newest versions of .NET. So if you're building a .NET project, then every night you can test it against the latest available version of .NET to ensure that nothing has broken along the way. Also checking your code for passwords and vulnerabilities. We've seen this a lot that uh, companies will accidentally commit code that has secrets stored in it. So you could use a GitHub Actions to actually test your code to ensure that it's not leaking any passwords or, um, or has any vulnerabilities. And something that's really cool about this is I've seen with GitHub Actions, not only does it test to make sure that none of the dependencies are vulnerable, but if there are, then it'll actually create a, a pull request that just fixes everything for you. That's super cool. Next, it can help check to ensure that your project stays compliant with required regulations if you're in a heavily regulated industry. And also, this was one of my favorites. You can update your database with data from sources such as screen scrapes or remote repositories. And this one is, is close to my heart. It's on my to-do list. I actually created this VM for one of my projects called KB Update that goes and it scrapes um, the Windows catalog for KB information and built this VM, wrote up all this code, set it into a scheduled task. And then later on, whenever I was like, I was freaking out about my, my Azure bill was too high and I was like, oh, I need to delete everything. So I deleted that VM and, and ultimately I kind of broke my module in a way because it's no longer updating. But this is, this scheduled task is a perfect example of the usefulness of GitHub Actions. You can just use the scheduler workflow and, and create something that is in code. And for me, I didn't have this in code, right? Um, it was just a scheduled task in a VM. It wasn't stored in a repository and I lost all of that work. Another thing that it's good for is scheduling and publishing blog posts and tweets. So it's not all about uh, just enterprise work, work stuff. You can also use this for some of your hobbies as well. Also, I thought that this was really cool. This is a trick from Stefan Stranger. He actually used GitHub Actions to enable his network admins to keep up-to-date records of IP assignments and available addresses uh, for his Azure virtual networks. And I thought that was really clever. So earlier I talked about how the GitHub Actions can run um, can run against any GitHub event. And this is pretty much an exhaustive list 
For me, I usually keep it simple. I'm using push and pull requests, though in the future I can see that I'll be using schedule. But whatever you're into, if there's a GitHub event that's available for it, then you can run your action against that event. Next, okay, so these workflows, it's really awesome. Sort of like other CI CD processes, they'll spin up these little temporary VMs. And with GitHub Actions, it runs with Linux, Mac OS, Windows, and containers like we had talked about before. But also, you can self host and run it against ARM if you're interested. You can set up a little Pi and run it that way. Also, in addition to supporting PowerShell, these runners support Node.js, Python, Java, Ruby, PHP, Go, Rust.net, and I was wondering, does it support COBOL and Fortran? And the answer is yes. So I know what you're thinking. This is a lot of power. It must cost a lot of money. And magically, and I even like double checked to make sure that this was true, there are no usage limitations for public repositories. It's completely free no matter how many minutes you use. Now, if you have a private repository, that does change uh, depending on the product that you have. So most of us are probably in the free or the pro subscription. Um, and you can see here that there are some limitations, including Linux minutes. So Linux is the baseline, right? So if you have 2000 Linux minutes, that's the baseline. And then if you're using Windows, then you will have um, 1000 Linux minutes. And if you're using Mac OS, watch out because that is actually only 200 Linux minutes per month with the free tier. If you go beyond um, the usage for your, for your tier, then uh, and this is only, again, for private repos, then you do pay a per minute rate. And you can see it's very reasonable for Linux, but not so much for Mac OS and a whopping eight cents per minute. And with Windows, um, it is more affordable as well. So in addition to building these workflows, you can also build your own reshareable actions and share them onto the marketplace. And this was what this is what really got me into um, actions. And I wanted to know more and I didn't want to learn TypeScript. So I was really excited when I found out that suddenly you can write these actions natively using PowerShell because that's pretty much uh, the primary language that I speak. So again, I'm going to tell you GitHub's formal definition and then tell you how it is that I came about to use it. So with composite actions, you can now create reusable actions using shell scripts and even mix multiple shell languages in the same actions and reuse them for different workflows. So you don't have to share them out into the marketplace. Um, if you have an action that's common amongst all your repos or within your organization, then you can just share it within there. Now for me, I was really excited because at first, whenever I was like, okay, I need to build something, but what do I build? And I didn't really know what to build until I started making these more advanced workflows. And I realized that every time, and I'm really commit heavy, right? So it'll take me like 500 times um, to get anything working really. And each of these 500 times, it would go out to the repo and it would download PS framework or DBA tools or whatever. And I kind of consider that, um, I don't know, it feels kind of bloated. It increases the numbers. And not only that, it takes time. So it would add at least an additional 10 seconds. And what I really wanted to do was cache. If you've already installed something from the PowerShell gallery, I just wanted that to happen once and I was able to use a cacher and then create an action around that cacher because it really did take a lot for me to understand how to use GitHub's cacher and I wanted to save people time. So I was, as I was going through and I was creating this reusable composite action, um, it took me some time to get used to. And whenever I'm working with a new technology, I do translate it to PowerShell. So as for the PowerShellers out in the audience, 
there are going to be three basic components of composite actions. And the first one is input. This is really important. So think parameters, right? Something that you're going to pass in. This is similar to PowerShell parameter. And then runs is similar to the process block in PowerShell. And then the output is an output object. So let's go ahead and take a look at the repository for PS module cache, which is the cacher that I wrote for PowerShell. Oh God, how did it get so dark? I'm messing. All right, so this is the GitHub repository for the action that I created and published to the action marketplace. Uh, it's called PS Module Cache. And what I love about actions is that they are straightforward. There's a very small number of files that are required, unlike something like a TypeScript repo where you just have tons of files to start. So this is what it looks like. We have the license and a readme as well as the action. And uh, the moment that you put an action.yaml into the root of your repository, you will be offered the ability to uh, publish to the marketplace. And then that action will call the main.ps1. So let's go ahead and look at how it was that I began this journey. So as I'm creating my workflow, <sighs> I needed to download the same PowerShell modules over and over again, right? We talked about this. And I'll cover this very quickly because we've also talked about this. So here's our actions workflow. Again, it happens anytime that I push to the repo, anytime that I create a pull request. I set my default shell to PowerShell and I run it on Ubuntu. I'm just copy pasting here. I just want to repeat this mantra, copy, paste, replace. That's what I did. And that's how I learned this. And you're more than welcome to, <laughs> you're more than welcome to copy and paste from me. Thanks, Kitty and Potato. <laughs> so, so now we're going to download and start the container. I'm still using uh, Docker at this point because this is like my first run, right? I write that license to the path. And then here, whenever I realized, okay, I don't want to download this over and over and over. I literally Googled GitHub actions, uh, cache, and I found this cacher. So the cacher looked pretty straightforward at first, right? Like, oh, this ain't so bad. I could just copy paste. So I see here, I'll just copy paste this this uses, and then I'll probably replace the path with something that's more PowerShell centric. And then I have this key. Now oh, the key is interesting. So we have this runner.os. Um, and by the way, this, I know it kind of looks, if you're not familiar with, with YAML, this looks a little intimidating. It did for me, but you just copy paste and replace. And then we have these hash files. I don't know what that meant. So I scrolled down and I saw this example workflow and I literally built my own composite action using this example. So let's go ahead and see what my first composite action looked like. All right, so I copy pasted, right? And then cache PS modules, I, I wanted to, I love like generic variable names, keep it as simple as possible. Then the path, now this is something I had to work very hard to find out because this path has to work on Windows, it has to work on Linux, and it has to work on Mac OS. So I ran, I committed, this is part of my, you know, at least one of my 536 commits was to figure out all of the paths. And here I put PS Framework and Posh Job. Posh RS job. Then for the key, again, I wanted to keep it as generic as possible. Next, install required PowerShell modules. So this says, if there hasn't been a cache hit, so if this has never run before with this key, if this key has never been used in a run before, then go ahead and execute what's coming next. And initially, I did this. I just installed module PS framework, posh RS job, and it turns out that I needed to do the set repository and trust the PS gallery. This was another one of the 536 commits. And uh, 
something else that that I didn't realize was that you didn't need this. So I'm already fixing that. But along the way, I had to invalidate it, right? Because once I change that, then I need to say like PS module cache one, right? But then I needed to add DBA tools. DBA tools. And then I needed to invalidate that. And then I ended up like just with the longest key. And I realized I wanted to save other people from experiencing all of this because it did take about two days for it to be pretty. So I'll show you first what it looks like to use this action. Similarly to the way that this has a readme that you just copy and paste from, the same is true for PS module cache. Oops. So let's go here and view on the marketplace. And now we have this documentation and you're basically just going to copy and paste this. I wanted this to be shorter, but unfortunately until GitHub supports actions within composite actions, that will not be possible. So we just copy this whole thing, copy, paste, replace, right? This is the only, like it says here, just copy the the code below and modify this line. That's all that you'll need. But because this is a talk about creating a PowerShell action, then that is something that we'll go through step by step. So, all right, VS Code is telling us that this isn't valid. Just hit tab and we're set. So now let's go through this step by step. Here we have the name, which is set required PowerShell modules. And you'll see that whenever you run your action, the ID is PS module cache and the uses is really cool. This is the, the uh, username slash repository name at, and this V1 is a release. But if you're developing, you can create a branch called test and just change this to test and it will use the action in that branch. So we do V1. Okay, so pay close attention to this modules to cache. This is, as the instructions said, the only thing that you actually need to modify. But let's change this from PS Framework to Posh RS job, because this is my literal requirement for 10 tools. Next, we're gonna set up the module cache. You can skip over this. And then if you remember that path that we had before, right? That it was like slash home, slash runner, slash whatever, slash modules. We don't wanna have to come up with that. And that's what this actions does is that it determines a bunch of things for you using the output. So here is the input of the action and here is the output. So just copy and paste this weird YAML formatting. And this is steps, PS module cache, outputs, module path. That's the first output, right? We're gonna figure out how we determined that module path coming up shortly. Next up is, it's another output. It's the key gen and that corresponds with key. So instead of the runner OS dash PS modules, one, two, three, four test, this is gonna actually output what we need. Next up, there's one more output, and this these are the PowerShell modules that are needed. So if you say install module, and this is really cool, you can mix and match PowerShell. So you have this install module, you just copy paste this, and you change that needed. And let's go ahead and take a look at the action that accepts the parameters and then generates that output. Okay, so first we have the name, which is PowerShell Module Cache, and this is what's going to appear on the marketplace, along with the branding. I really like the branding. It just makes it nice. It's very clean. You have a selection of icons that you can use and colors as well. Always like, you know, this is the download um, and dark gray. I always like the simple kind of colors. And the description, cache modules from the PowerShell gallery. Here's our inputs. Does this look familiar, this modules to cache? Yes, indeed. Let's move this here. 
And we have here the modules to cache. So this is going to say PS framework and Posh RS job. So the modules to cache description, the PowerShell modules to cache from the PowerShell gallery and required is true. That's similar to the PowerShell parameters value of mandatory. Next up is outputs. Remember these outputs? So let's go ahead and look at the main.yaml, right? So the first output that we see is module path. And we can see here module path. Here's the description the default module path for the OS the value. And you just copy paste this. Now, how did we get this? We'll see that up next in the run section. But for now, we're just going to cover the inputs and the outputs and then the runs. So we have this module path is going to do the steps PS output dot outputs dot module path. Next up keygen also very similar used here keygen and needed remember this that was passed to the install module and there is needed so how is this generated in this modules to cache original request it was just something that i had needed to see as i was debugging so how did we get these outputs the first thing is that this is where powershell comes into play where we no longer need typescript we have a runs that uses or that's using composite. Next up, the steps. So we have the ID as the intro, and I did want to mix and match the shells as we had seen in the in GitHub's definition. So here we have shell bash, and then we have echo gathering information for modules, and then you see this inputs modules to cache, and that's inputs modules to cache. So you could see that inputs dot and this inputs dot modules to cache. So we can also see here outputs dot keygen. Outputs dot keygen. Okay, so next up is the ID, which is PS output. See that here? We have this PS output here and this PS output here. Now, this, unfortunately, there's no way that I know of to make this pretty. It's just kind of a, a mishmash of YAML and PowerShell. Um, but whenever you copy, paste, and replace, that's something that I did that you can do as well. And you just copy, paste, and replace the things that you need. So here we have needed. There's needed, right? So what does needed output? How does it get that information? Seems here, so you have your action path, right? which is the PS module cache repository, and then slash main.ps1. And, and we're about to actually see the main.ps1. So we specify the main.ps1, and then we give the parameter type of needed. And then we give it another parameter, module. And this takes the inputs from modules to cache. So you could kind of visualize it in your head that this is main.ps1 dash type needed dash module PS framework posh RS job. Okay, now we have the key gen, and that's the key gen here. And so this is main.ps1 type key gen module PS framework posh RS job. Keep this in mind, and we'll take a look at the main.ps1 momentarily. And then we have main.ps1 type module path. And then so we specify our modules, PS framework, posh RS job. So now let's take a look at the PowerShell itself. This will be immediately familiar, right? The module, PS framework, posh RS job, and then the type. Then we'll go step by step. So first I create an array to hold the needed list. This is all of the modules that are required because you could pass in uh, Pester, but Pester already exists on the system. So it wouldn't need to go to the PowerShell gallery and re-download that. Next, I want to get a collection of all of the available modules that are on the system. And this does take four seconds. I tried to find a way that was more efficient, but unfortunately, this is the one that gave the most accurate listing of modules. 
Next, we say for each item in module, that's our parameter, right? So for for PS framework in PS framework, comma, posh RS job, if PS framework isn't already installed, which it won't be, then add that to the needed list. If posh RS job is not already installed, which it's not, then add it to the needed list. Next, if you remember the type, so we had the type of needed, the type of key gen, and the type of module path. Needed has this right output, and it essentially gives you your needed list, and it takes that array, and it just makes it a string. So then it'll be PS framework, comma, posh RS job. Next up, the key gen. So before we had the runner dash PS module cache, one, two, three, four, test. But instead, what this is going to do is that it will use the platform, which is like Win32NT. So it'll say Win32NT dash PS framework dash posh RS job. So that's the key gen. I actually don't remember why I put this here, but it's <laughs> if I remove it, it'd probably be problematic. It probably needs something other than nothing if I had to guess. Next up is the module path. So this is the path where, where you want to install it. This is the cached directory. So the cached directory for Win32NT is what you see here. Took a lot of commits to figure that out. And then if it's anything else, if it's Mac OS, if it's Linux, then it's going to be here. So it'll cache that entire directory. Pretty cool, huh? So we've looked at the action.yaml. We've looked at the main.ps1. Let's go back and just take a look again at the main.yaml, kind of, kind of put this all together. So we have our set required PowerShell modules, the PS module cache, which is used here. We have the uses, which is my repository. Then we have our inputs, modules to cache. Then we have our outputs that are used here. So it's executing that PowerShell to get this information. And because this is a PowerShell group, I wrote a concept PowerShell script that kind of made me laugh, but it really helped synthesize. I even copied and pasted the descriptions to match. So I created this concept command that helps to convey composite actions using PowerShell concepts. So here we have um, the synopsis, which is cache modules from the PowerShell gallery. And if we look here, we have cache modules from the PowerShell gallery. And I did expand upon it just a little bit to say conveying composite actions using PowerShell concepts. What are the concepts? Things like parameters, things like outputs. So we have our parameter, modules to cache, right? So the PowerShell modules to cache from the PowerShell directory, and that is something that we see here. So we have the help in both the action.yaml and the concept.ps1. You remember how we had that required equals true over here? So we have required true. That's similar to PowerShell's parameter mandatory. And then we have this string. So with, with GitHub Actions, you can just pass a comma delimited. And same for here with the modules to cache. So as we go through, it says gathering information for modules. And that's even here too. If we look, it will say gathering information for modules. Then we have the needed. Remember the needed? We had needed, key gen, module path. So we have this PS script root, which is the same as this GitHub action path. And then we execute main.ps1 type needed module modules to cache. Same for the unique key generator and for the default module path for the operating system. And now we have the output. So it's needed key gen, module path, and modules to cache. And let's go ahead and take a look at what this looks like when it's executed from PowerShell. So now we're going to invoke PS module cache, set our modules to cache to PS framework and posh RS job.
So cool, right? So this is actually what GitHub sees whenever it's running in its own environment and it has its own type of output. This kind of gives us a visualization of the output. So we have needed, in this case, I don't have PS Framework installed and I don't have Posh RS job. You could see this key gen instead of being the runner OS dash PS module cache, one, two, three, four, test, test, test. This generates the key gen. And if we change this, check this out to DBA tools, then it'll regenerate a different key gen and invalidate the other key, which means that it will go out to the PowerShell gallery and re-download those modules. So all in all, I hope that this gives you a good understanding of GitHub Actions and GitHub Composite Actions and how cool it can be within your PowerShell workflow. If you have any questions, again, please feel free to reach out to me at twitter.com slash cl. I just realized that I have about five minutes left, so I'm going to throw in some lanya or some extra. If you're interested in running your GitHub actions locally, you can Google local GitHub runner and then you see this nectar slash act. First of all, you can read the documentation about self-hosted runners, which is like running on your Raspberry Pi. Um, but if you're looking for local runners so that you don't have to go and check GitHub over and over, I find joy in that. So I'm going to continue using GitHub's process. But if you're interested, you can go to this repository and then follow the readme there. I was told this uh, by Justin Grody. He has a lot of really great actions. And he even uses some really interesting techniques to create that key gen that I was talking about. He relies on the PSD1, which if you change your required modules, then that would change the hash of that key. So I thought that was really, really smart. Also, he introduced me to the GitHub Actions extension for VS Code. And I'm kind of resistant and hesitant about most VS Code extensions because they reduce the performance of VS Code, but this one is absolutely worth it. I've used it and I've enjoyed it. If you Google GitHub Actions VS Code, it's the first one. Let's see. Yeah, so it's Christopher, um, and it has this little black icon. So what's really nice is that there's autocomplete and documentation, which is just really cool. And one of my other favorite parts of this is actually if you create your, if you perform a commit and it starts running your action, then, sorry for the scroll, It'll tell you here, so you don't have to sit there and wait in front of GitHub for it to complete. You can tell from right within VS Code if your action has completed. This is what it looks like if you're using it. So you remember this, how we set up the job, we started up the container, we wrote our Nessus license, we skipped our PowerShell module install because we've already gotten it from the gallery. So you can watch this occur live and you can manage your self-hosted runners. And before, during the presentation, I went out to github.com and I created that secret. You can just create your repository secrets right here, which is really, really nice. So I hope that you, you enjoyed that little bonus. And thanks again for joining me. By the way, if you've enjoyed this presentation, I do a lot of uh, PowerShell chill streams on twitch.tv. You can find me at twitch.tv slash potato quality -E -E. And I'm also in the PowerShell Discord. I am at CL. Thanks again for joining.